Okay, I'll be discussing this work called Secure Quantum Computation with Classical Communication. Uh, and this is a work about the notion of uh, secure multi-party computation, which studies the setting where uh, we have multiple parties, each with a private input Xi, that wish to compute some public circuit C over their private inputs um, by communicating with each other and all learning um, the output Y. Okay, and so we don't want um, these private inputs to be leaked to other parties. And so for security, more formally, we say that um, any adversary that corrupts any subset of these parties, so for example, uh, party two and party three, that they won't learn anything about the honest party inputs, x1 or x4, except what they um, already could have learned from just the output of the circuit. Okay, And this is you know, a very well-studied notion. It goes back, um, the study of MPC goes back to kind of near the beginning of um, modern cryptography. And um, you know, another uh, notion that's been studied, at least now for a couple decades, is um, uh, it's the generalization of MPC to this, the setting of multi-party quantum computation, which is uh, where every party can be quantum, um, and maybe they each have quantum inputs, and they want to compute a quantum functionality over their inputs. Okay, and you can define security in the same way. Okay, but kind of the starting point for this work is noticing that so far, MPC has really been studied in one of these two settings, either like every party is classical or every party is quantum, okay? Um, but I mean, you know, quantum technology is it's seemingly quite difficult to, to construct. So um, for the time being, uh, it's going to be the case that there's only gonna be a few quantum computers out there in the world, right? So a pretty natural question uh, to ask is, well, can we, um, you know, achieve MPC or can we do MPC? Can we achieve any notion of it um, when we have some mixture of classical and quantum parties, right? Um, so can we do some like secure, can we, can we do MPC for quantum functionalities where not every quantum or not every party has to be quantum, right? So uh, for example, um, you could consider the, this following notion where we maybe have one quantum server, uh, the party one, that's interacting with a bunch of classical clients. And they all want to come together to compute some quantum functionality over their private inputs, okay? And so this is the type of notion that um, I like to study in this work. And so we can, again, define security the same way, an adversary that corrupts any subset of parties, like including like collisions between clients and server, uh, that they won't learn anything about the honest party inputs, okay? Um, right, so, this is what uh, this work studies. And the starting point is uh, some prior work on kind of protocols that can be, uh, you know, that can be interpreted as basically like single client, single server, um, two party protocols, right? So in this setting, we have like one, one client with a quantum circuit uh, Q, um, classical input X. So this client is classical. We have a quantum server and uh, you know, they interact back and forth. And at the end of this interaction, the, quant the client outputs Q of X, okay? And um, in particular, I want to cover, you know, mention two protocols that were constructed um, a couple of years ago um, for this setting. So Mahadev um, in 2018 gave a protocol for quantum fully homomorphic encryption, okay? Which um, basically achieves the cryptographic notion of blindness in this setting, which means that a malicious server is not going to be able to learn the client's input X um, while interacting in this protocol, okay? Um, so another cryptographic notion that you could, uh, or no, another security notion uh, that you could hope for is, is kind of more of a correctness notion, which means that the malicious server cannot cause the client to output a false outcome. And indeed, Mahadev in 2018 constructed this protocol um, called classical verification of quantum computation that, that achieves exactly this. So I'll call this soundness where a malicious server cannot cause the client to output um, a wrong output y not equal to q of x, okay? You know, so prior to this work, there exists these two, pro these two protocols, uh, two different protocols in this kind of like single client, single server setting, okay? But if we want to achieve like a, the full, full notion of secure computation um, or MPC, um, it really requires a protocol that achieves both blindness and soundness simultaneously. Parties need to hide their inputs from other parties and they need to be um, ensured of the correctness of the output. Okay, so we need kind of one protocol that combines both of these. Okay, so, you know, let's try to do that, actually. So let's look at like this, let's look more closely at first this, this blind like QFHE protocol, right? And so syntactically what happens is it's only a two message protocol. You know, the client will just kind of choose a public key 
um, we'll encrypt their input X under the public key, send it to the server. The server will evaluate the functionality under the encryption and then return the um, evaluated ciphertext back to the client, which the client can then decrypt. Okay. So this is the syntactically what QFHE is. Syntactically what CVQC is, the, the sound notion. Um, here I'll give kind of a, an example of like what a two message protocol could look like, but in general, it could be more than two messages. Here we have a client that, um, you know, construct some public parameters based on um, the circuit and their input. And we have no notion of hiding for these public parameters. They could include like in the clear descriptions of Q and X, right? But uh, what the server can do is run some like prove algorithm that, that outputs uh, the evaluated um, circuit Q of X along with uh, some proof of correctness. And so now the, verif the client can go and verify that this proof is correct. If it is, then they will happily output Q of X and otherwise they're going to abort. So this is, this is the um, syntactically what the CBQC protocol looks like. So um, recall that basically as a first step, we just want to combine both protocols. We want to get a notion of both blindness and soundness at the same time. Okay, so there's a really natural way to try to do this. Like let's simply run um, the CBQC protocol under the hood of a quantum FHE. Okay, so I'll call this like a blind CBQC protocol. And again, you know, what does this look like? The client just chooses some public parameters, encrypt it under the um, FHE public key. And now this, the server can evaluate the proving algorithm under FHE, give it back to the client. The client then just does two steps, right? First, it decrypts the ciphertext to get to the Q of X along with the proof, then it verifies the proof, okay? So this seems like a pretty reasonable protocol that, would, that achieves both blindness and soundness at the same time, right? Okay, so let's try to use this protocol um, to, you know, construct what I, you know, want to construct one, what I mentioned that I wanted to construct at the beginning of this talk, right? Which is just a, you know, a notion of MPC between multiple classical clients and one quantum server. Okay, so let's say we have three classical clients, we have one quantum server. Um, a pretty natural idea now is to say, well, let's use classical MPC to emulate a single client interacting in this like client, this blind CVQC protocol that I just mentioned, okay? So they're gonna basically use classical MPC to become a single client that has, you know, as input, uh, the concatenation of the three private inputs of these parties, okay? And what does this look like? Then they can interact with the server, right? They can encrypt these inputs um, in the blind CVQC protocol. The server can run the, the prove algorithm under QFHE, and then they can use classical MPC to kind of, uh, you know, decrypt and verify the output. And then all these clients can either output like, you know, the correct output or, or an abort. Okay. So, right. So this is, I don't know, that like, are we done? This is like, this is uh, the first attempt basically at saying like, well, let's just put blind CV, let's just put QFHE, CVQC together. Let's put classical MPC on top of it. Does this give us actually what we want? Like a protocol um, for secure MPC. Um, and so it turns out that it's not the case. There's actually an attack on this protocol, okay? And to see this, uh, let's say that like all but uh, one client are corrupted, okay? So the server is corrupted and they're colluding with, you know, some, some client, okay? So um, since the server is corrupted, what they can do is they can, you know, they can produce a false proof here and they can do this under the FHE, okay? So what is the server gonna do? Like under this FHE, they're going to um, compute a valid proof, like how an honest prover would would compute it, uh, depending on like whether, like depending on the uh, the input x3. So this is the honest party's input x3, and the server can kind of operate on this input under FHE, right? So let's say they can com compute a valid proof of x3 is equal to zero, and an invalid proof of x3 is equal to one. But what does this mean? That means that when the clients like kind of decrypt the output, they'll see the correct output Q of X1, X2, X3, if X3 is equal to zero. And on the other hand, they'll see a bot or an abort if X3 is equal to one. And, you know, recall that like these clients can see this output. And so, you know, this means that this adversary, like this adversarial clients um, can completely learn any bit of X3 just based on the output of this protocol. Okay. Um, you know, so this is kind of an attack that completely breaks the security of the protocol. Any more generally, like kind of any predicate on any honest party's input can be um, can be learned using, you know, this is basically what's called a um, selective um, abort attack, okay? 
Um, all right. So the takeaway um, is that really, if you just just try to mash together standard blindness and soundness, it's not going to be sufficient for for building and achieving like the full notion of of MPC. Okay. In particular, what it really boils down to is that we need this notion of blindness to hold, even if the server can observe um, whether the client accepted its proof. Okay. Um, like you know, note that like what we just the, the problem with what we just saw is that like the adversary or like the prover as, as, as soon as like we allow them to see like what the honest client or honest clients output, um, as soon as we allow that, then they could kind of use that information to break privacy. Okay. So we need to explicitly prevent this from happening. Um, and this sort of thing can be, um, can be captured via, you know, what I, via the notion of um, what I call like composable blind CVQC. And this is like, basically a blind CVQC protocol that satisfies a, or a particular ideal functionality, okay? And this ideal functionality is going to be parameterized by the public circuits queue. It's gonna take um, a private input from the client and just a bit B from the server indicating whether the server is being honest or malicious, okay? If the server is being honest, it'll just output Q of X honestly back to the client. If the server is being malicious, it'll just abort, okay? And so, so what does it mean to emulate this like, or to satisfy this, this ideal functionality? That means if we have a, a protocol between a client and a server, kind of like a real world protocol here, where the client you know, has some output Y, the adversarial server has some arbitrary output um, quantum state Psi, then um, you know, this output is going to be indistinguishable from a execution in this idealized world, right? Where the client just, all they do is they submit their input X to this ideal functionality there's a simulator that just inputs to the ideal functionality whether this whether the um, server is being honest or malicious, and then the client's output is determined by the ideal functionality. Okay, and so we want to say that these are you know these are indistinguishable, and this really captures this this notion of um, the stronger notion of blindness, um, really because note that like basically whether the sim whether um, the server is being honest malicious or malicious like this bit um, cannot depend at all on um, the client's input X, okay? So they cannot um, determine whether or not the client aborts based on the client's input. And that's kind of like captured within um, this, this real ideal world um, paradigm for implementing this ideal functionality, okay? So, you know, the I guess the, the goal of the rest of this talk is to basically discuss how to um, construct such a composable blind CVQC. Um, before I do that, I'll just give a little bit of, um, you know, I'll note that actually this is this notion has been studied before. So in particular, um, this work of 2014 showed that um, there are a couple of protocols um, of, of more am I and FK17 um, that are composable blind and sound delegation protocols in the setting where the verifier is quantum but performs limited quantum operations, okay? And these are protocols that achieve information theoretic security, okay? So these are like basically protocols between a, a limited quantum verifier and a fully quantum um, server, okay? And you want to achieve both like compo both um, blindness and soundness in a composable way, okay? So this is this notion has been studied before. Um, and then more recently, so GV in 19, actually what they, they did construct a composable blind classical verification of quantum computation protocol, which is exactly the notion that I'm interested in, um, assuming quantum hardness of learning with errors, except that they do have like their, their security is kind of is non-standard in the sense that they don't achieve and they don't achieve like standard negligible security. Okay. In particular, like the difference between a real and ideal world is going to be some inverse like you could distinguish them with some inverse polynomial probability and where that polynomial grows with the communication complexity of the protocol, okay? And moreover, their, their protocol um, is highly interactive and, and takes polynomially many rounds, okay? So that's kind of the prior work. Um, so now I can really say what the main results of this work are. And the main technical contribution is this, our new constructions of this composable blind CVQC uh, primitive. And in particular, we do, we obtain like a four message protocol that's like fully, you know, negligibly secure um, from the quantum hardness of learning with errors. And we can also compress it to two messages and even kind of distribute the setup among multiple parties. Um, again, from um, QLWE, but um, also 
um, operating in the quantum metamorphic model. Okay. Um, and so this is again, this is the main technical contribution. The main applications is to show then how to use like these composable blind CVQC protocols to construct um, MPC um, with, between quantum and classical parties, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, right? And so our protocols are going to be, you know, we're studying the notion of like malicious security, um, although we're going to uh, allow uh, for, you know, execution in the CRS model where you can have a, a, a common uh, random string setup. And the functionalities that uh, our protocols are going to support um, is what I call like pseudo deterministic quantum functionalities. Okay, so these are quantum functionalities that have classical inputs and outputs and that are like pseudo deterministic in the sense that for each, for each input, um, there's going to be uh, one one output um, that's output by Q, except with negligible probability. Okay. Um, and so like those various settings that, that we study. So uh, one setting is where we have multiple classical clients in one quantum server and you know they all wanna interact and then all the clients wanna output the result of the circuit. And we give a six round protocol from PLWE and we can also give like a three round protocol, basically like one round from clients to server, one round from server to clients, and then one round for a kind of a joint decryption um, in the in the Q realm, okay? And then we also st study the notion of uh, just this two-party setting with like one classical client, one quantum server, and we give basically what's called a NISC or a non-attractive secure computation protocol for the setting, um, again, from LWE in the Q realm. So that just means basically a two-message protocol. So kind of a round optimal uh, two-message protocol for this setting, okay? Um, Right, and so the, for the remainder of the talk, uh, I'm just going to be focusing on this um, composable blind CBQC protocol. Um, and then, yeah, I would say if you want to see exactly how it, like this protocol is used to build these MPC applications, I'll encourage you to see the paper for that. Okay. And really, what uh, you know the starting point of this is is to notice that the issue with this previous approach that led to this kind of abort attack was the fact that in the blind CBQC protocol. Uh, the, the verifier, when they received the prover's message, what they first did was decrypt and then they verified, which means that like, if you, if you want to like fully verify the proof um, and be sure that the prover is being honest, you actually need the decryption key to do that because you first decrypt and then verify, right? Um, and this is you know, what was preventing us from arguing that like this protocol um, satisfies blindness in the stronger sense, right? So, um, a paradigm that's been useful uh, for getting around this problem, like in the classical setting, it's been used before, is, you know, can we switch? Can we first verify and then decrypt, right? Um, so in this way, you wouldn't need the decryption key for verification. And so like, even if the prover can see whether uh, the proof verified or not, they might not be able to break blindness because the, the decryption key was not necessary for, for showing verification, right? So this is the goal, basically. Can we verify then decrypt? In our setting, that means can we actually use the CBQC protocol to first prove a correct evaluation of QFHE, and then only after that decrypt the QFHE. Okay, so unfortunately, it's not actually this straightforward, and the reason is that um, this protocol of Mahadev, the CBQC protocol that we're using, actually only supports pseudo deterministic circuits Q. Okay, and I kind of explained informally what that was on the last slide, but more formally. Uh, Q is pseudo deterministic if for, for all classical inputs X, there exists a classical output Y such that like Q of X equals Y except with um, negligible probability, okay? And so we know how to do, like, you know, Mahadev showed how to do CBQC for such, such uh, functionalities. Um, the issue is that if like the QFHE evaluation, the thing that we actually want to apply this protocol to is not pseudo deterministic, okay? And the reason is that, well, like what happens is that like, if you take a ciphertext encrypting X and you evaluate it, evaluate Q on that ciphertext, what you obtain is a distribution over output ciphertext encrypting Q of X. So even if Q is deterministic, this ciphertext is actually a distribution over the random coins R, okay? So, you know, this is, this is why it doesn't like work. I mean, you can't just like kind of switch, switch these and just like plug in CV, you see it to prove the correct evaluation of QFHE because it doesn't work syntactically. Um, but um, we'll still try to follow this verify then decrypt paradigm. And instead of uh, directly using you know, Mahadev CBQC protocol, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a, a more recent protocol 
uh, due to Chang et al, CLLW, um, that can actually handle, in some sense, um, it can handle like um, um, verification for what's what are called quantum sampling circuits. Okay, so this is a high level idea. Okay, and again, this is exactly our goal is to construct a blind CVKC protocol following this verify then decrypt paradigm. Okay, and before I actually explain like the steps for doing that, let's just let's just like dive a little bit um, farther into just like Mahadev CVKC protocol. Okay, and so really what her protocol is, is a combination of, of two sub protocols. So one is this FHM, FHM delegation protocol, and one is um, what's called the measurement protocol, which, is, which, which actually makes up the bulk of um, uh, Mahadev's work, okay? So this, this underlying delegation protocol that's being used um, considers um, basically a quantum prover and a quantum verifier. And it supports pseudo-deterministic circuits Q. This is actually where the, rich, just the restriction to pseudo-deterministic circuits is coming from. Um, you know, soundness is actually information theoretic. There's no cryptographic assumptions. Um, the drawback is that the verifier is quantum. Okay, and so what happens is that it's just a one message protocol. The prover sends over a quantum state. The verifier basically just immediately measures this state in a series a sequence of bases. So either standard either standard Hadamard bases. And so this notation is basically meaning that like for an n bit, for an n qubit state psi and an n bit uh, string h, um, you basically measure each qubit of psi in um, either the standard or the Hadamard basis, depending on whether the bit h of i is equal to zero or one. Okay, so basically the verifier just takes this, this state, immediately measures everything to get a string y hat, and then applies some classical post-processing on that to obtain the output y. And so this is kind of a, the delegation protocol that we're starting with. Um, what Armilla showed how to do is how to take um, such a protocol and basically outsource this measurement part of it to the prover. Um, in the end, turning the verifier completely classical, right? So, you know, the, a measurement protocol, what it does is it allows a classical verifier to delegate standard and Hadamard basis measurements to a quantum prover, right? So, you know, now the verifier has as input, it's its measurement basis h, the prover has as input a um, quantum state psi, and at the end of the protocol, the verifier outputs uh, the result of measuring psi in h, okay? Um, and so let's, you know, let's kind of review the issue with, um, you know, this, this final protocol is that this underlying FHM delegation actually su only supports pseudo-deterministic circuits, okay? Now, I did mention there's kind of a newer work of CLLW, what they do is they, um, what, one of the things that, that they do is they construct a underlying protocol here that's, that has a couple different properties. It actually supports sampling circuits Q, um, which are you know, quantum circuits that output some arbitrary distribution over classical outputs, okay? Um, so that's good because like that in particular captures QFHE evaluation. But unfortunately, um, the soundness, it's still information theoretic, but it, it is relaxed to an inverse polynomial soundness. It's not standard negligible soundness anymore, okay? So again, this is, you know, um, the idea is still to basically take their protocol and combine it with a measurement protocol, but we're gonna have to be careful and try to, um, you know, our, our eventual goal is to get the standard notion of, of delegation and MPC with negligible soundness, okay? So um, this construction basically proceeds in three steps. Okay, so we start with the CLLW protocol. Okay, and we note that, so in general, it only has inverse polynomial soundness error. But if we apply it to the special case of verifying a QFHE evaluation of an underlying pseudo-deterministic pseudo circuit, then actually we can obtain a negligibly sound protocol um, by basically parallel repeating it. Okay, and of course the resulting protocol still has a quantum verifier. Um, but our second step is then to combine this with um, you know, Mahadev's measurement protocol to obtain a protocol with a classical verifier. And right away, this only gives like a one half sound protocol because of uh, the structure of this measurement protocol. We have to parallel repeat that again to finally obtain a neg a, like finally what we want, which is a negligibly sound protocol with classical verifier, okay? Right, so I'll go like through each of these steps in a little bit more detail. Um, so first, what we want is a, you know, a protocol with negligible soundness and a quantum verifier. So 
you know, what we're going to do is we're going to have the verifier, you know, take their input X, first encrypt it under QFHE and send it over. And here's where the CLLW comes in. What we're going to have the prover do is, you know, basically run the CLLW prover, um, you know, to prove, you know, to evaluate um, the ciphertext to basically an encryption of Q of X and send over a quantum state basically proving that this evaluation was done correctly. And so the verifier can run the CLLW verifier um, to obtain a correctly distributed ciphertext, right? You know, up to some error, um, you know, and the CLLW soundness error, we can set to any parameter, but it has to be inverse polynomial. So let's just say we set it to one fourth. You know, what this guarantees is that the ciphertext alpha by the verifier is distributed um, kind of, let's say, let's say within one fourth statistical distance of what it should be, which is an encryption of Q of X. So what that means is that when the verifier then goes and decrypts that ciphertext, we're guaranteed that they decrypt it to the correct value with probability at least three quarters. Okay. So this is where the parallel repetition comes in, right? We have like a three quarters sound protocol. All we can do is just parallel repeat the CLLW protocol lambda times. Now the verifier obtains lambda different ciphertext, they decrypt all lambda ciphertext to get a bunch of like values of yi. And a natural thing to do is just to have them, you know, take the majority out of the yi's that they decrypt. So just like whichever is the most frequently occurring y in the set, they say that that's the output. And you can show that basically, essentially by Chernoff, it follows that like the probability that this output y is equal to the correct answer is, is um, overwhelming. Um, and I say Chernoff star because you need like a little bit like um, not everything is independent, like, um, because like, for example, the prover could be entangling these states, um, but kind of a, like basically a very similar argument to just like standard QMA amplification shows that you can actually get this um, turn off like argument to work. Okay. And so importantly, what we've constructed, it has a couple important properties. First, the verifier like first verifies, right? And only once it's convinced that like, you know, all these, you know, all these CLLW sub protocols accept, then they just decrypt. Okay. So there's no mixture of these steps. And in the end, they obtain, we obtain a negatively sound protocol. Okay. So if you recall, the next step is to basically make this verifier classical. So let's look at this verify procedure. Um, recall that, um, you know, due to the structure of the CLLW protocol, all this is, is all the verifier does is they first like immediately measure all the provers states in some basis H. And then they apply classical post-processing circuits to the results to produce the ciphertext. So this is like the part where you know we're going to outsource to the prover using um, uh, Mahadev's measurement protocol. And so tactically, what this looks like then is that um, Mah like Mahadev's protocol is basically this for message like commit challenge response type of protocol. Okay, where here so here of course the verifier sends the encryption of X like before, but then they engage with the, pro the prover in this kind of four message protocol, which at the end of which the verifier either, like if their challenge was zero, either just accepts or rejects, or if their challenge was one, um, actually goes and obtains like an output ciphertext, which they can then pass to the decrypt procedure, okay? Um, so I'm not really gonna go into more details about how this measurement protocol works, um, but this is kind of syntactically what you get, okay? And because this challenge is only one bit long, you actually right like right now we actually only end up with a, a one half soundness protocol. Okay. So the final step is to boost this one half sound protocol to a negatively sound protocol. And again, we're going to do this with parallel repetition. Okay. And again, naturally, you know, what we're going to do is we're just going to repeat this measurement protocol in parallel lambda times. Okay. And so, you know, what happens when we repeat it lambda times? How do we define the verifier? Well, so you look at all these challenges, you know, some of them are zero. And if any of the sub protocols were set, if any of the sub protocols um, reject on a zero challenge, we just, the verifier just rejects, um, you know, otherwise the verifier collects all the outputs on like the one sub protocols, passes them to the decrypt procedure and still take a majority of those, okay? So again, we still maintain this, this crucial structure that there's first this verification procedure, which like doesn't use the, FHE secret key at all. It just like basically uses the underlying like measurement protocol, right? It just basically either rejects or accepts and pa passes along the ciphertext. And at this point, 
the ver there's no the verifier no longer has an option to abort. It just simply decrypts and then outputs the most frequently occurring Y in its set of decryptions. Okay. All right. So it basically remains to show that this parallel repeated protocol is indeed negligibly sound. Okay. And there is um, some prior work on showing that the parallel repetition of these sorts of protocols is sound. Okay, and one such work is um, is this work of ACGH, and they gave basically the following parallel repetition parallel repetition theorem. Okay, they said, okay, let's say that your under your single repetition protocol, like over here, satisfies the following property. So the property that for any you know malicious but efficient prover P star, if it's the case that they are almost always accepted on like a zero round. So if, you know, if they're almost always accepted when the challenge is zero, then uh, the probability that they can cause a false outcome when the challenge is equal to one is negligible. Okay, so it's kind of like if they're like passing one of these challenges, then they're like, um, if they're passing like the zero challenge with overwhelming probability, then they only have a negligible chance of cheating the one challenge. So they're saying, okay, let's assume your underlying protocol satisfies this property, then and your parallel, your parallel repeated protocol satisfies this property, namely that, um, you know, again, for any efficient um, but malicious prover, it holds that the probability that the prover is simultaneously accepted on all zero challenges and can cheat on all of the one challenges is negligible. Okay, so they show that this is, this is gonna hold. Okay, and so this is actually good enough for like just basically parallel repeating like, uh, um, plain CVQC, but it turns out this is actually not good enough for our setting. And so why is that? Um, note that in this parallel repeated protocol, if the prover cheats on half of these one instances, then it can make the verifier accept a, fa a false outcome, right? All it has to do is like change more than half of these YIs to be some other ZI, and then the verifier will output like a wrong, a wrong Z, right? So actually what we really want to say is that we want the stronger property that, um, you know, for any efficient P star, it, it holds that they're simultaneously accepted on all zero rounds and can cheat on like even half of the one rounds still with negligible probability. So this is kind of a stronger uh, parallel repetition theorem that we want, which is what we show in this work. Okay. And this is then enough to show the soundness of this, this protocol. And so I can, give like a slightly closer uh, look at this parallel repetition theorem. So, you know, abstractly, what we're looking at is, is the following situation. It's kind of like a quantum prover signal protocol with classical communication. Okay, so we have a commit phase, like a one bit challenge, and then a response. And this prover, you know, we're, this is all classical communication, but we're allowing like a malicious prover to be quantum. Okay. And we can set up some notation. So basically the state of the prover after this commit phase we'll call psi sub p. And then we can associate with this verifier two projections that would be applied to psi sub p, which is basically like pi zero is the projection that projection onto the space um, where the verifier accepts when the challenge is zero. Pi one is a projection onto this onto the space where the verifier accepts when the challenge is one. Okay. So what ACGH did was they basically you know, a rephrasing of, of kind of the property of the single repetition protocol that I had on the last slide is the following. Um, and it's called what they call a computational orthogonal projector property. It's if for any efficient P, the, you know, the expectation of this um, expression is negligible, right? So basically that like this prover state cannot essentially satisfy both of these projections, pi one and pi zero. And so this is, in particular, this, this property implies that the protocol, it's like stronger than saying it's just one half soundness. It's kind of an extra structural property on the, on the security of this protocol. Um, but in particular, it does imply that the protocol is one half sound. And so what they show is that, okay, let's parallel repeat this protocol lambda times. So let's sample the challenge, um, you know, randomly from the space of all lambda bit strings. Then what you can define is a different um, acceptance projector for each challenge. Okay, so now there's like two to the lambda of these acceptance projectors, um, which are basically um, formed by tensoring like all the accepting projectors of, uh, you know, for each of the uh, single, um, each of the underlying single repetition, single instances, right? 
And so, okay, what they proved is actually that, you know, if the single repetition protocol has computational orthogonal projectors, then all two lambda of these projectors defined here are all kind of mutually computational orthogonal. Okay. And you can use that to, to prove that the parallel repeated protocol is negligibly sound. Um, it's not really important to follow these details, but basically what you are proving is that basically the expected value of, you know, of like basically the, um, this expression basically, should, which represents like the prover accepting on challenge like um, CH, right? So the expected value over a random choice of the challenge you want to show is negligible, which you can basically write out this expression, um, kind of square it and write out all, all the terms. And what you use is, what, like crucially what you use is the fact that each of these cross terms is negligible um, due to the computational orthogonal projector property of the underlying protocol, okay? So this is what ACGH showed. So in our setting, you know, we would like to do the same thing. The crucial difference in our setting is that um, we have to define these acceptance projectors for the parallel repeated protocol slightly differently, okay? Um, we can't just like tensor the individual um, projectors together because we have a different accepting um, condition. You know, the verifier accepts actually if, you know, um, you know, if all of the challenge zero um, projectors accept and at least half of the challenge equals one projectors accept. Okay. And so what this means is that we no longer have the um, guarantee that all of these like pi challenges are all mutually computational orthogonal. Okay. In particular, the prover can kind of pass two different like projectors corresponding to different challenges if the challenges are kind of close enough in Hamming distance. So at a very, like at a high level, basically what we end up doing is we set parameters. Actually, we change a little bit how this challenge is um, distributed. And we set parameters basically um, so that it's not that all of the, um, all of these projectors are mutually computational orthogonal, but it's, it still holds that an overwhelming fraction of them are. And that's still good enough to get the entire, get the final proof to go through and, sh and show negligible sums. okay? So we end up with a, a situation where an overwhelming fraction of these pairs of, of um, projectors are indeed computationally orthogonal, okay? And so that, that was just what I wanted to say, like diving a little bit deeper into the, um, kind of the strength and parallel repetition theorem. Um, Okay, and now I'll just give a quick uh, recap of what I've discussed. So, you know, the main goal uh, of this paper and what I was discussing is to construct a blind CVQC protocol following this verify and then decrypt paradigm, right? Um, because like this is exactly what's useful for um, achieving what I call this composable blind CVQC. And, you know, such a protocol then has many applications to MPC um, in this new setting, this kind of like this new setting of like, you want to compute uh, quantum functionalities between some quantum parties and some classical parties, okay? Um, and so the building blocks that were used are kind of this QFHE protocol, the measurement protocol, and then like uh, crucially the CLLW delegation protocol for quantum sampling circuits. And again, the three steps um, were to first parallel repeat CLLW to get a negligibly sound protocol with quantum verifier. Then we add the measurement protocol on top of that to make the verifier classical. Um, but we end up with only a one half sound protocol and then we can parallel repeat that using a strengthened version of the ACGH theorem. Okay, and we end up with uh, what we want, which is actually just a four round negligibly sound protocol with classical verifier. Um, and that's, um, so that's all I wanted to say here. So thank you for listening.